like to call the March 23rd, 2020 meeting of the Greenville City Council to order. I'm Mayor P.J. Connolly, and I will be moderating tonight's meeting. First, before we get started, I'd like to call on uh, Councilmember Brian Meyerhofer to make a motion to amend the policy to allow council members to phone in for the meeting. Councilmember Meyerhofer. Thank you, Mayor. As you can see, we're missing a few council members here this evening. As such, I'd like to make the following motion. Based on COVID-19 and furthering the goal of preventing the spread of COVID-19, I move that the following additional rules apply for today's council meeting, and such rules shall remain in effect in future council meetings until terminated by council. First, any council member be allowed to participate and vote by teleconference or other electronic means. Next, a member of the public may comment during the public comment period by telephone call to the council chamber. And finally, the maximum number of persons allowed in council chambers during the meeting is 50 persons, and that number includes council members and staff. Second. All right, motion's been made by Councilmember Meyerhofer, second by Councilmember Daniels. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Rick Smiley with aye. All right, eyes have it. Thank you very much. That was Mayor Pro Tem Glover, for anybody listening. All right, uh, for the invocation, if you would please join me in a moment of silence, please keep the uh, first responders and our medical professionals in your prayers. Amen. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Connolly. Here. Present. Council Member Bell. Here. Council Member Smiley. I'm here on the phone. Council Member Litchfield. Present. Council Member Meyer. I'm here. Mayor Connolly, we have a All right. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the approval of tonight's agenda. Madam Manager. Um, Mayor, I would request that the council add um, a presentation following the public comment period. The presentation will be by Brian Floyd, Chief Operating Officer for Vidant Ho Health Hospitals and President of Vidant Medical Center. I believe the city attorney also has an item to add to the agenda. Would you like to add that to above, the, you said, the consent agenda? Yes, sir. Um, following the public comment period okay. before the consent agenda. Okay. Attorney McGirt. Thank you, Mayor Connolly. Uh, Mayor and council members, there is a memo and an ordinance at your desk that I also emailed to all of the council members uh, entitled Clarification of Mayor's Authority to Issue Emergency Proclamations, and I would ask that be added to the agenda, perhaps in, in new business. Anybody like to make a motion? So moved. All right, motion been made by Council Member Bell, second by Council Member Daniels. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? My aye. <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Ayes have it. All right, we'll move on now to the public comment period. Public comment period is a period reserved for comments by the public. Items that were or were scheduled to be the subject of a public hearing conducted at this meeting or another meeting during the same week shall not be discussed. A total of 30 minutes is allocated with each individual being allowed no more than three minutes. Individuals who registered with the city clerk to speak will speak in the order registered until the allotted 30 minutes expires. If time remains after all persons who have registered have spoken, individuals who did not register will have an opportunity to speak until the allotted 30 minutes expires. Madam Clerk, our first speaker. Mayor Connolly, we do not have any speakers signed up. All right. Anyone present that would like to speak during the public comment period? Please come forward, state your name for the record. You have three minutes.
Seeing none, we'll close the public comment period and we'll move on to first item. Thank Which you, Mayor. We'll have a presentation by Mr. Floyd. Mr. Floyd currently serves as the um, Chief Operating Officer for Vidant Health Hospitals and also serves as President of Vidant Medical Center. Mr. Floyd. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Council, for having me here today. I appreciate your, your uh, kind gesture of having us to help talk about this health care crisis and COVID-19 and what it means for Greenville and what it means for our medical community. And so I'd like to share a few comments and then uh, bring some information forward to help us uh, have some dialogue about uh, why Vitan Health has a significant concern and interest in us doing all we can to shelter in place and quickly get us to a, a condition of safety here in Greenville. I was asked to illustrate some things for you about this, and I will, but before I do, um, I recognize that there are multiple fears associated with COVID-19. Um, and, and for a council like this, there's the fear of public safety, but there's also the fear of economics. There's the fear of the fear itself among people, which I know a governing body like this is charged to help protect. Um, but on the other hand of the equation, as we balance out actions we take or don't take, is life. And we don't have to guess what happens with COVID-19. We are watching it play out in other markets. And you're going to hear me say that there is no data to suggest we are not going to be impacted by COVID-19. And there is no data to suggest because it's North Carolina, the United States, or Greenville, that it is not going to spread in its natural course any differently than it has in New York and in other markets. So um, as a representative of Biden Health, there's 14,000 of us on behalf of the doctors and staff who are coming of a, 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 a considerably consensus opinion about all these things. We have been preparing for quite some time how to respond uh, for weeks now with COVID-19. It's an incredible organization. In this city alone, there's more than 7,000 people that are part of the work at our medical center, which is now a thousand bed hospital that serves the 29 counties of Eastern North Carolina. It's a great organization, but I believe its ability to respond in this crisis is dependent on what we choose to do as a community, as much as it is the steps we have taken to be prepared for this crisis in and of itself. Um, we had to make difficult decisions as an organization. We had to spend extra resources at a time that healthcare has reduced uh, resources to be prepared for this. Then we had to make decisions to send people home that we didn't have to have in the organization, a decision we made over a week ago. And on top of that, last week we also made a decision to cut off our most significant revenue producing part of the hospital while we we're ramping up these expenses for a long period of time by canceling procedures and elective surgeries, which has a profound impact, not only to the hospital, but also to revenue producing physician practices who depend on the ability to do these procedures to balance the portfolio of healthcare expenses and revenues. So it's a significant thing to do for a more than $2 billion organization. But we made these decisions to protect our healthcare workers and to prepare for our ability to protect the public in a time like this. So it's not just, you know, one thing we're saying and not something we're doing here. We are doing what we're asking the council to do, and that's heed what is happening in other markets. So uh, the Spanish flu is another thing to learn from 1912. So I could tell you the tale of two cities, Philadelphia and St. Louis. One, both sheltered in place when the flu spread. One, well before the curve hit their community. One, after it was too late to beat the curve. One, devastating consequences to both lives lost and tremendously different economic recovery to one that had tremendously better lives lost and better recovery time. We've seen this kind of thing before in the world of epidemiology and public health. And of course, we're all reading in the news and I'm very well aware of what happened in Italy 
what's happening in New York and, and many other cities where drastic measures are being taken to try to prepare for something we haven't seen in the century as significant as this virus is to us. And we want you to know as your health care provider, we're not going to get away from COVID-19 unless we take significant actions. And even then, it will still affect Greenville. So let's talk a little bit about um, COVID-19 is not a linear virus spread. Um, it is not spread as the flu is. The flu would affect one and one point so many people. This is one and two and a half to almost three people in the way it spreads. So significantly, it doubles every two days and its impact person to person. So it, it spreads, it's not linear, it's compounding as it starts to spread, which is why you see curves that don't look like this, but curves that look like this once it takes place. I mentioned 1912 because this is what these curves represented, the difference. In the city that beat the curve with its actions, this was their curve. A city that waited too late and sheltered in place and took drastic actions after the curve began, this was their curve. We are using these curves today also to make the point that today, this is healthcare system resources available to manage this kind of a crisis if we wait too late. And that's just the reality. Now we are a thousand bed hospital, the 21st largest hospital in the United States. And still, according to Becker's Healthcare, which does this if you, if you wanted to, to reference that, but as such a large hospital, the reality is it's full most days, even that large. Not because of what happens in Greenville, but because of the regional demand for services in a region with higher comorbid conditions, higher sicker patients, lots of chronic diseases, and an elderly population in many rural communities without enough access to health care. We all, we all know that story that built this large you know, hospital serving this region. So the question is, who's at risk? It's that population. We're the only tertiary resource available for them. And Raleigh markets are going to be, are, and already are building up capacity and becoming overwhelmed with treating these patients and treating their other patients that they already have. And Biden Medical Center is going to be no different than that, serving an entire region uh, with resources built for this. And we can't have this happen. When this happens, the drastic decisions have to be made and lives are lost because of the decisions we have to make simply don't have the resource to do what's required for these patients. Just a quick reminder for you, these are the curve rates of the other nations, many of whom you've heard the more drastic consequences like Italy, where people, both healthcare workers and the patients they're serving, losing their lives because there's not enough resource. And their curve is the green one here. This dark one right here, is the United States curve. It is already a sharper curve than Italy. It is already a sharper curve than Spain. It's already a sharper curve than Germany. And of course, we are at the beginning of a wave they experienced ahead of us. But the virus hasn't mutated or changed its way of taking off. It's just how soon it happens and then what that curve looks like thereafter. Are we already experienced, and this is a question that uh, we hear, and the answer is yes, both here and in our region, we now have cases, uh, patients with COVID-19, uh, we have hospitalized patients with COVID-19 as well, so it's not, not coming this way, it's already in our market. When I was asked about how this plays out and thinking about these curves, those curves are so important because of what I showed you at the beginning about trying to be in front of a wave. Because if you wait too long, once the wave happens, it's compounding rate starts and you're getting too far behind to then take action to prevent the acceleration of that wave and that curve. This is North Carolina right now. This is already the cumulative prevalence of COVID-19 in our state. So the number is almost is 300, almost 300 cases already. But what I would call your attention to is the rate, the curve that we're talking about. 
it's not a flat curve already. It's already a steep curve in North Carolina alone. This is the blue line represents new cases that we are seeing of COVID-19. And what I mentioned about it isn't linear, it doubles every two days is what we see day to day. Is it increases, it flattens, it increases, it flattens, and it increases. And so we're seeing the curve. Am I, let the record state that the mayor wanted you to adjust this. <laughs> Yeah, if you want, we can just hold them, honestly. I, I've got a, a great easel here named Brian. He's an awesome easel. So uh, let's see how he does after seven more of these. So uh, this is what we're seeing here. And by the way, this doesn't account for today's new cases, which have increased from the previous day. So this is, and one reason why we know this is happening is that the state systems are overwhelmed. They cannot keep up with the number of, of tests that are coming in. And so... Uh, there are behind on the backlog of positive case identification because there are days backlog of tests at the state lab systems. And we have limited testing capability, which I'll talk to you a lot about in just a moment, because of reagent availability. So uh, when we look at what's happened in North Carolina, if we took the actual cases and we mathematically uh, played it out, the, the, the trajectory looks like what I'm describing. We haven't seen a thing in North Carolina yet that would suggest it's bending down or that it slows. It keeps increasing. So now let's talk about Biden Medical Center in our community and region. This is day-to-day. Uh, -day. Now we took this, this model was built by Penn State's epidemiology and state resources looking at what we know about COVID's treatment plan, what we were trying to ascertain is how many patients get hospitalized, how many of them are in the ICU, how many of them require ventilators. The reason is those are critical resources for managing the sickest of these patients. And without those resources, those are the patients the healthcare system can't serve and, and they don't survive. They die because there's not enough ventilators. That's just a reality of Italy, that's a reality of New York right now. So what we've been talking about here is how many new admissions do we see these are daily admissions, and of course, at the beginning of this, they're slow. But when we play the model out, and the admission numbers continues to increase, days out from now, 35, 40, 45, and 50, if we follow the same trajectory of others, it builds over time as it compounds, and you get more and more hospitalization, more and more ICU. This is the curve of actual ICU, not a guesstimate, but what happened in other markets, what percentage of them needed ICU and ventilators, and then more use of ventilators. So how does that play out over time for an organization like ours? If, and these are just Pitt and Green County's current volume put into the model of what happens from an epidemiology perspective. When we get out here to 50 days, our projections would say 600 admissions to the hospital. That's the daily census at Vida Medical Center 50 days out if the curve does not bend with COVID-19. I currently have a census with only a handful of COVID-19 patients. I already have a census of 600 patients. I have 907 beds to work with. And I already have 86 patients on a ventilator right now that are not COVID-19 patients. So with the limited resource of a hospital, if I have any projection based on what has happened in other countries, the length of stay of the patients, how long they stay in the hospital, how many of them convert to ICU, and how many of them convert to ventilators, then the math tells us our projections push out to these kind of numbers. 600 plus what I currently have is almost 1,200 patients. And we have 907 beds. And 600 of them, and of those, we're seeing numbers of almost 300 that are ICU and almost 120 that are ventilated on a ventilator, plus the natural sickness of patients that requires me to put those 80 that I have on a ventilator now. It means more than 200 people on a ventilator. So that's just two counties, Pitt and Green's numbers, 
mathematically project it out. This is when we look at the same data point, and now we're talking all 29 counties. All, tw I know that's worse. Man. All 29 counties, same kind of data. These are daily admissions, how it plays out, and this is when you accumulate those admissions, they stay in the hospital, the, the progression of care path for a patient with COVID-19, the average, they get ICU, they get ventilated, same data, and you can see we now look like we're up to 750. And by the way, this is based on our current rate of uptake, which is a low rate because we're at the beginning of the curve. So when we mathematically take where we are now, it takes us out to here. Not if this curve continues to ramp up and we started that data and it gets worse. Now, could it get worse? Well, there are very few of the Eastern North Carolina communities that have cases yet. But here's the thing, three days ago, I didn't have any either. We didn't have any, three days ago. And then we had a case, then it doubled, then it doubled, then it doubled. Now we're up to a higher number of patients that we're managing, just like other markets have seen. So as it hits Eastern North Carolina, this is a very low projection of the potential burden of care required by our hospital under those circumstances. So, uh, you can put it down now. When I show you that, I'm not doing it just to, to scare us, but we feel a duty to the communities we're serving to be real about the best data we are given to work from, from those experts in the field. And I don't have a model that doesn't project significant health care need. And back to the first one I, I showed you, this is 974. If these were ventilators, this is less than 200 ventilators. This doesn't take into account the protective equipment, the masks, the shields, all the protective equipment required for a hospital with a, ter a tremendous number of these patients in them to make sure we can keep our healthcare workers safe and that we don't get into the situation we've seen in the other countries where the doctors and nurses are the ones that are sick and they're the ones on the ventilator and then your capacity to care reduces. Which brings me to a point that I feel like I have to make. If this is 200 and I've got curves that show me out here, now, with where we are now, you can imagine then why we are so anxious to say, we gotta take the actions necessary to stop or slow this curve coming into our market. I don't have a projection that tells me differently than that. It's just the reality. So, <laughs> The other thing to keep in mind is Greenville has benefited, and, and we all know it's great that we have this great academic medical center here in our city. Uh, but it serves a whole region of people. I often hear people say, well, there's not the density of a Raleigh market. But is that the measure? Um, the reality is almost, so I have 7,000 of the employees at Biden Medical Center live in a town that when you take the students out, how many of them are actually the citizens of Greenville? What percent of Greenville is the Viden team? So if one in six are Viden, and we have compounding rates, and I need those people to take care of those curves, if they get sick living in this community, it's not the same as just your volume, because they are not one, not six of a million people in a city, there's 6,000 of 60,000. So it doesn't take long if a natural spread rate takes a hold, it's taken out a greater proportion of the healthcare workforce required to make sure we can care for whatever our curve is in Eastern North Carolina when it is so severe and everyone's dependent on us for it. And so we, we are employing you to do what you're doing and we're so grateful to see the actions that you've already taken. I mean, that's so important, and thank you for beginning that process. But we also feel it's important to go further and protect the public from something that's too easy to believe isn't going to be a big deal. Uh, most people around here live through hurricanes. When there's a Category 5 coming, we don't wait until the night before the storm to prepare for that storm, thinking that we can do all the prep during the storm. And if you were here during Floyd, none of us believed it was ever going to be like it was. 
that we were a week with no water running a hospital or that people would be coming off rooftops from helicopters to our hospital that doesn't have running water because they haven't had dialysis for days and they may die. We didn't all believe that was going to be the reality because the storm happened and left and things seemed okay. It was a bright sunny day and then the water came and it came in ways we didn't fully anticipate, right? We can anticipate this hurricane we're dealing with now because we see it in the other markets and I'm just asking us not to fool ourselves to think somehow that curve is going to be different. That was the first thing people said about the United States. We have better time to prepare. We have better health care infrastructure and resources. Our curve will be slower than the curve in those other countries. That has not been proven in any data so far. So I wanted to present that to you to give you the story of both the help we feel that we need for our community, the help we feel that we need to protect our hospital and our team members to be able to do this very difficult work that's required to get through this very sustained uh, virus that we're dealing with. I know it's not an easy thing, but we wouldn't be here if we did not believe uh, that the health of our citizens were not at the bottom of this. Dr. Wallerman is with our county commissioners right now as we speak, having the same conversation and I'll stop here and see if there are questions and things that I can answer as best I can for you. Any questions for Mr. Floyd? Councilmember Meyerhofer? First of all, thanks so much for appearing tonight and doing the presentation. I thought that was great. Um, thank you for all of your employees. Um, I mean, I know I speak for everybody when we're, I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, cheering them on through this process. Yeah. Um, what is the process for your intake um, for someone that is uh, believes they they may be they may have the virus and what I mean by that is um, if somebody's calling from Greene County do they just show up at the door to the emergency room or are you requiring that they call first I'm curious about that, about the intake procedure yeah yeah well it's it's a complex answer as all things in healthcare tend to be right there are multiple ways in which things tend to happen obviously patients who are sick enough that they feel they're, they're, the thing to do is to go to the emergency room. We never tell people they can't come and we don't tell them you can't come and you got to call first, that kind of thing. We do ask people to call first should they feel the need to go to the emergency room because they believe they are COVID positive or that they might be because that at least lets us get in front of it and be prepared at the front door for what kind of patient we're dealing with so that we we are ready. Now, if you go to the emergency room right now, for instance, you'll see a different emergency room entrance. We have moved in a mobile home system that does triage, built a whole decking system around it. We have put tents up for testing the COVID populations and we route them to prevent just the general flow to the emergency room in our emergency settings. Uh, at Viden Health, we manage this and all of our hospitals in the region through one single intake system. So when we get the call of a patient, we try to triage what's happening to the patient. And if it's possible for us to route them to a physician, like a clinic, another route for testing, we will. If it's an acute care need, we bring them into the system uh, through either a community hospital or at Biden Medical Center directly. And of course, there's emergency entrance that comes. We have a process by which we test patients based on their urgency. If we think this is a hospital admission, we do what's called rapid testing so that we can make sure we quickly find the answer if they have it because the longer we have them in testing with us in the hospital and they don't have it we are burning through limited supplies of this what we call PPE the masks, gowns gloves all those things required to to take care of these patients uh, so we need to know quickly if that's not necessary so we preserve and conserve our supplies there are limited supplies across the world of these products now which is why we can't just order them if we need them. So we're conserving. Um, so if they aren't in the urgent need that we're going to put them in the hospital, presume they're positive, uh, or they go into an ice, we then go the most critical patients first, because the sicker you are, the more you burn through all these supplies. Then it works down a triage process that gets to standard testing, and standard testing goes through lab systems that take much longer. Those lab systems take days to get a result back. And so we could have a patient for four days waiting on the result from state labs or other labs. You might ask, why can't we just do them all here? There are limited reagents for these tests, limited testing capability all across the world because everybody is getting these, these same test reagents that have had to be built for the test. 
So we started just this past weekend with only having 24, abil only the ability to do 24 tests at the hospital, 24 of these, half of which had to be our controlled, so 12. So with a hospital that's as large as ours, taking in four and 500 ED patients a day, you can imagine why we're judicious about who we're gonna give that rapid test to and who we're gonna route into a more lengthy response time of getting the result back. And that's why you hear of people who don't need to be in the hospital getting a test, going home and being in quarantine until the results come back. And that's why you hear of those in the hospital with having sustained waiting on the test result to come back. And what we are doing is building the capacity as we have built our own testing capability, had it approved and validated, getting the reagents in, that over time we will have an increasing amount of our own ability to do these rapid tests then in a couple of weeks, we hope we can do a lot of them. We're already greatly farther ahead than we were. But you can imagine why the slower that curve takes to come, it gives us time to build up that lab testing capability in time. So by the time they're here, we're not just burning through all of our PPE. There were hospitals in Georgia that used six months of their PPE in one week with limited supplies, and now they don't have them. And they're trying to figure out how to make them or how to come up with them when their healthcare workers are dealing with these cases. So it's a big issue, uh, one that we are well prepared for, but one we have got plans that are very uh, carefully planned. I don't know if that's answered your question about what we do with these tests when they come in, these patients when they come in. So with the most serious, um, I mean, you guys serve 29 counties, you have mm -hmm. facilities throughout the east. Will the most serious cases be brought here to Greenville or will the other facilities be able to handle some of these? Yes. We, so the good thing about Viton as a system is we manage all of our hospitals as one big hospital spread around the region. Our goal is to try to keep as much of the care we can close to home. And each of our hospitals, now we centralize inventory, we centralize resource, so it's not like one of our hospitals is going to burn through all the resource and now VMC doesn't have what it needs. We manage that all centrally. But as much as we can, unless a patient reaches the condition we don't think they can be cared for close to home, which is probably related to what kind of doctors they have or don't have for the specialties needed, uh, we will keep them close to home. For those that call in, uh, do you guys provide them any other instructions on the, uh, when they come into town? And just something that's popped in my head as we're talking here is um, if someone's calling ahead and you guys are giving them instructions, would, would or could that also include to this uh, person that potentially has the virus to say, hey, don't stop anywhere. Don't go anywhere else in Greenville on your yes. way in here. Just come straight yes. to the hospital. Don't visit any other places as you make your way here. Yes, yes, we do. Okay. When we know, but here the reality is we don't always know. People don't always, we don't know until they come right, here many right. times. I, and I was just referencing Most those of the time call. we wouldn't know, unless it was someone that's reached out, has been part of the system, they touched the system in a clinic, or in a hospital in the region, or an emergency room, or another non vitan hospital, and they call us and tell us what we're dealing with. Otherwise, we generally don't know mm -hmm. until they get here. But in all cases, when we know, we have COVID lines, we have nurse call lines that we have built for this purpose, and we are now pushing them out to the public to be able to use those resources to let us know what you've got. And there's always vitannow.com that's available to the public 24-7 if they have questions and that sort of thing that we can help them with. Thank you. I appreciate it and, and your team and let us know how we can continue to help. So one of our council members that happens to be on the phone right now, council member Rick Smile, had a question. You kind of started to talk about it. He had a question about the personal protective equipment and how much supply is available still. I mean, are you guys pretty set as far as that's concerned? So um, yes and I have to qualify that, that it all depends on the use rate, right? Sure. So the reality is with a national shortage of these things, we have a certain set product line that comes in, 12,000 masks a week, let's say. And that's our normal use rate for all the patients we care for now. This drastically increases them, and we have in the past built reserve capacity for even pandemic. <clears throat> But we've never built the capacity for this kind of pandemic when the whole world was consuming supply. So, you know, I, got, I had a story today of a supply line truck that was going to a hospital. The hospital in Louisiana let us know. Truck got there and it was empty by the time it got there just because it had been pillaged by somebody. Um, there's a shortage and people are desperately trying to get them. So we have supply. 
we have teams that have been working for, the, for weeks now on building con conservation plans for even the supplies we have. No one should be wasting face masks. No one should be just discarding them. In our, on our own uh, team members, when we use them, we're trying to find ways to conserve them. One mask will last longer through conservation techniques, and we're even working with engineers and others to build ways. Can we actually recycle, clean, sanitize, recycle for our team members if we get to that point where we need to do that? That's being done all around the country now. There's a lot to our supply lines. Yes, we have enough. Yes, we are running our hospital. Yes, we're prepared for numbers of these patients. But if we are 50 days from now with the numbers we're talking about, that's a different story. There will have to be replenishment of supplies. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Councilmember Daniels. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. Excellent job. Um, what are we doing to ensure that the uninsured and low-income areas feel as if they are going to get the same treatment as everyone else mm -hmm. is getting? Well, at, at Biden, obviously, that's always an ongoing thing that we want to make sure happens, right? So as I said before, we don't distinguish the care we provide to patients or let them into our facilities on the basis of their ability to pay whatsoever. Um, and so access, though, has a lot more to do with other things than that, the presence of a physician close to home, hospitals, emergency clinics, and that kind of thing. So we are universally accept acceptable. We are, are universally accessible, rather. Mm -hmm and we use the same mechanism for everybody in how we uh, make those services available. And then one more question, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, do you, how do you handle it when someone tests positive who has family members? Do they also get tested or is it suggested that they quarantine? So uh, these, these things start to depend on uh, the, the algorithm associated with availability of testing, how much testing can we do, symptoms people may or may not have but yes we do have a plan when we have a positive patient we then try to figure out who's at risk in that and we try to work with them on. Okay. thank you councilmember bell thank you for the presentation it's very informative i really appreciate it um executive order 120 was issued today from the governor's office um do you think that goes far enough or should local governments be taken no, it does not and when you look at the uh, studies uh, um, of how these things have been handled. It, the local markets have also in times past made their own decisions uh, about how they were going to be aggressive in protecting their communities. And they got different results than mass groups did. And so uh, all I can tell you is what I have told you. These curves don't distinguish. Urban markets have a higher number, a higher concentration. We hear more about that, but the curves don't change about how its uptake happens. It's just how many people, right? But if the same rate is applied in all the markets, it's still the same rate of your people, the percentage of your people, right? People think urban and rural are different, but if you do the, the research on this, what you find is they are different in terms of how fast the uptake is. They aren't necessarily different on what those curves look like, but the outcomes are very different because rural communities tend to get hurt more. They have sicker people with higher comorbid condition, which is absolutely true for Eastern North Carolina. So patients in those markets don't necessarily do as well as they will in markets where they're a younger population, obviously. And so uh, things are local. Healthcare is always local. And we need to take into account who's most at risk and what does Eastern North Carolina look like relative to the most at risk population? And I think we'd all understand that's why we have this big health care resource because we have a lot of health care need. Are there any specific steps that you would recommend? Well, shelter in place is what we believe, where people are sheltered at home. You know, the idea of 50 people gathering together is a lot of people gathered together still. Right. Um, what we are saying is be at home unless you don't, unless for as long as you can be and as much as you can be. And when you do come out, recognize 50 people is a lot of risk to be, to be sharing. Uh, shelter in place would imply shelter with 10 people, five people, four people, your family, except for the use of essential services when they're needed for, for folks from home. That's what we would love to see happen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Daniels. It is early to say that now. 
um, you know, we are looking at China and other models to see how that has been, ha how long the taper is, um, but we know that it isn't quick. And we know these things have to stay in place for an extended amount of time. We are at the beginning of a curve, not the end of it. And so we have to live through the life cycle of it, hopefully flatten it as low as we can, and then at the end, uh, we are going to know a whole lot more about exactly what that uh, sanitizing period looks like that we can um, now feel more free, and I would be early to say that at this point. Councilmember Lichfield. Uh, Mr. Floyd, thank you once again for your presentation. Sure. As everyone has mentioned here, it's um, very informative, and I certainly would uh, appreciate it if you share our appreciation to all your employees across the Vodat medical system uh, for, you know, the tireless work that they're, they're doing and uh, putting themselves in, in harm's way every single day. Um, uh, Council Member Bell mentioned um, uh, Executive Order number, number 120 that was put in place today. You know, there's also been um, substantial steps, um, you know, uh, universities closed, uh, public school systems closed, restaurants closed. Um, yeah, people working from home uh, throughout businesses throughout North Carolina. The city has people working from home. Um, so, so we're seeing a tremendous amount of, of you know, you drive around Greenville, it looks like a Sunday morning, right? Um, there's not Maybe. a tremendous amount of activity going on. Um, you know, one of the concerns is something you alluded to at the beginning of your presentation, the economic input, mm -hmm. the e economic impact of, of you know, uh, a shelter in place. Mm -hmm. um, would have on those folks that rely on a paycheck, that live paycheck to paycheck, that have to pay rent, that have to put food on the table for their sure. kids. And um, that's one of the decisions that we have to grapple with every single day. Sure. And, and so, you know, the things that have been done thus far, I, I fully support. Um, and uh, I think it's important that we all understand the impacts of, of the decisions that we make on those people that live paycheck to paycheck. I agree, um, and, and we've talked about that a lot, too, even when we knew we were going to come here and ask you for this. And the reality we keep coming back to is um, when you look at shelter in home, when you look at those who've had the best results, the flattest curves, they sheltered in home, they had masks, they went uh, all the way into shelter at home to get those results. When you look at the markets we are seeing, they did those kind of things you're talking about, albeit, I would say, too late. They needed to happen before they had infected people and those numbers were on the rise. You needed to do those things then. This thing's already in your community. By the time it's showing up, it's there already. And we know that from every other community where the curve was measured and the rates jumped up, right? So if it's a two week dormant life cycle, it's in the community by the time you start to see it test positive. So we're already in it. We're in the curve. We're not waiting on the curve now. The question is, is shelter in place a week ago, two weeks ago, a difficult decision to make. Yeah, uh, yeah, but you're in the curve now. You have people in the community with this virus. I don't know who they are and you don't know who they are. We just know they're here. And so the question becomes, um, which is the greater economic loss? The one from the loss of commerce or the slowed down commerce that you're describing or after there's been a wave and a pandemic response in this community with uh, hundreds and hundreds of people infected, medical bills, all those things that go into that that deplete the economy, take worker productivity away from employers, and has to be paid for and recovered on the other side of that. And once you shelter in place, which we believe you will make a decision to shelter in place at some point, it's not if you will, it's just when. And will it be when there's a significant part of the curve we're in? Or will it be if before that with minimized numbers of infected people? But we believe we're going to get there. Um, and so um, our epidemiologists, our belief is that that's what's going to happen. We're not asking you to, wh whether we think we will or won't make that decision. It is when, and we hope it's before we are not only seeing the economic loss of the shelter in place during the viral curve, but minimizing the number of infected people during it that could also have deep cost and deep financial consequence and live loss potential during that process. Just something to think about when we're weighing those issues. Do you have, um, do you have any knowledge or can you share a little bit about maybe what the hospital uh, community has shared uh, at the state level with decision makers there about the need to do this? Yeah, today 
all the health care systems were together and making a plea uh, regarding that, that we don't think it's enough. And so whether it was, uh, I wasn't in that particular meeting at the time that that one was happened, Dr. Waldron was, I was in a separate meeting with a different group. But Gene Woods and Atrium Health and Cone Health and uh, Dr. Waldron, UNC, uh, we're, we're notifying that we believe we need a stronger response than that. Thank now, you. what happens with that, I don't, I don't know yet. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Meyerhofer. We'll let you leave. I'm sorry. What, what kind of time frame do you think it would take for, for your preferred shelter in place? Do you think it's three days, seven days, 15? I mean, what's your, you if, you, if like it was answer. totally up to you, <laughs> what, what would it Last be? Last week, I mean, uh, at this point, or the weekend, right, when we started having cases. Uh, the question is... Um, in, your, in, your, in your in our opinion, preferred world, what, yeah, what, what does that look like to you? We would be making that decision now. And then for how long? I can't tell you that yet. Okay. It depends on the curve. I just can't reinforce enough. That curve is everything. It's, it's everything about how fast we can get through it, how much loss happens through it, um, and how much resource we all have that you, if any of us need those resources, we wanna know they're there for us, right? That curve will determine that answer. And so blunting that curve is super important. And, and that's really, I can't tell you until we see how, this, how it plays out. So I get to ask the last questions. <clears throat> so I guess my, my big question is too, if, if the ask is for a shelter in place for Greenville, Pitt County in general, how does that affect the rest of Eastern North Carolina? You guys handle 29 counties in Eastern North Carolina. Of course, we're probably the most dense from a, from a municipality standpoint of anywhere else or most of the places. How does that affect, so if we, let's say we did a shelter in place. I know we had talked to Dr. Silvernail, I think this weekend, and he mm -hmm. had said something that an incubation cycle is 14 days. And that was kind of the, the starting point, I think, that was, that was mentioned. So let's say we go through one incubation cycle of 14 days and we stop, but all the other communities around us are not in that same mm -hmm. mode of, of, of you know, shelter in place. How does that affect us when we've got other people that are coming into our community all the time and they didn't follow the same direction that we had and they are now coming into our community and potentially spreading that amongst the people that actually did. I kind of use it as that analogy based off of, there's probably a significant amount of people that right now are going home and yeah. staying home. And then there's other people that are out in our community right now that think it's nothing's wrong and they're going out assimilating with one another. Sure. And then they're gonna eventually affect those people that are staying home because they're gonna see them at the grocery store or they're gonna see them at the pharmacy or at a medical facility. And many of them may be the employees of Iden. So uh, at the end of the day, um, yeah, it matters. And if, I know this only because he's made the comment earlier today, if Dr. Waldron was epidemiology training, a physician, sure. and who said, if I had my drugs, I think he's, he shared this with you, I'd put barricades to the entrance of Greenville right now. And I would say, you can't come to Greenville right now. You have to have, meet certain conditions. You need to have a purpose, a essential purpose, or you need, there are certain conditions we would have to help make sure it's safe. I mean, it's that significant to prevent exactly what you're saying. Because we don't just have a population here we're serving. We have an essential health care resource for the region that we also have to keep well. Yeah. What, uh, so I guess the, to me, the, the end all would be, or, or, or the, the best scenario would be statewide, correct? What, I didn't hear what It would be correct. It would be the best way to go about this would be a statewide one, wouldn't you think? The best of all scenarios, absolutely. Because absolutely. then everybody in the state would be doing the exact same thing. Correct. And we do think, uh, and by the way, I, I was surprised myself to know that on the early end of this curve, if you'd asked me where we were going to see it, I'd probably have said to the west of us, more densely populated cities. But out of the first handful of these cases, I have one in a hospital in Rung Chuan, which does not suggest to me the curve follows densely populated groups at all. I already have it in communities, in a small community hospital already, right? So, um, and that's been the story of this virus. So I, I think, yes, we hope, and in all communities that we are in, we're making this kind of pitch and plea to say, if, if you can be at home, be at home. 
If you don't have to be in a room of 50 people, don't be. Just because someone gave a 50 number, shouldn't be. Um, because it's all about reducing any potential and delaying the onset and then lowering that curve so we get through this. And yes, we hope we model what we need everybody else to follow. Do you think that if there have been any other, you know, I know it's going to be very tough for the United States because this is relatively sure. new, are there any other maybe foreign cities that have used incubation cycles, you know, maybe one or two incubation cycles and seen a significant drop in that curve? Do we have any models of other of other cities that, that have done it for certain periods of time that we could potentially model ourselves after? You know, it's it's tough to gauge, and I know this is know. you know, and, and I've and I've talked to Dr. Silvernail and, and I've talked to Dr. Waldrum and you know, this thing's been around for three months basically. You have had three months to be able to study what's gonna happen with it, and nobody really knows. But are there other peer cities that this has actually hit prior to us? that we could kind of gauge that 14 days is sufficient because I mean 14 days for a business community is significant and I understand you know from a health perspective sure. you know sometimes you have to weigh that and and sometimes and, and health is, is way more important but you know when you're asking a community to sit through for 14 days and most people are gonna say okay well we'll we'll, we'll go ahead and quarantine for 14 days or, or we'll, we'll shelter in place for 14 days and then at the very end of it we say well that wasn't long enough then yeah, it so becomes here's very the problem difficult. with the math I don't want to go back to the fact it's not linear number one and so when things aren't linear that makes it very hard to do predictive sure. modeling on these things and the second thing is it all depends on, even when you say an incubation of 14 days, if the virus is incubating 14 days, which day in that 14-day cycle did the last person come in with the virus? Because if one comes in with the virus on day 13, sure. it isn't 14 days now, it's 27 days or whatever the math, 37 days later. And now, that didn't make any sense at all. <laughs> I got 14, you. Uh, 13 days in, another 14-day cycle. 27. 27 that takes place. Right. And depending on if that person's next person that actually they didn't know they were a carrier becomes a carrier, and now another person has it in the cycle, you know, you just don't know. The numbers have to, and that's why it's so hard to model this kind of thing and say, well, if you sanitize for 14 days, and if nobody in your market has it for 14 days, that could be a theory, I suppose, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but I could, would suppose one could argue that. But we already know we're not there. We already know we have infected patients. Right. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Floyd? But you can imagine by what you just said even, for the ideal state of having incubation, knowing that there are people who carry and people right now who are in our market with it, would be the reason why I don't know who they are, you don't know who they are. Shelter in place is the only way to try to make sure we stop any right. cross-contamination. Right. And again, that is, I realize we do know. Listen, I do know. This is a very hard thing for you to make that decision. But we would not be holding our mission to improve the health and well-being of the community any more than you would be to help protect the economy if we didn't say, based on what we know, we don't know what else to do other than this thing at this point. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. It. You got another question? Thank you. Uh, not a question. Okay. I would like to make a motion to direct staff to uh, develop a shelter in place declaration, work with the mayor on that, and bring it back to council for approval. I second that. Councilmember Daniels already seconded, but. All right, any other discussion? So I, I guess I have a question. This will need to come back to. Excuse me. This this would have to come back at another city council meeting then, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Um, but the city attorney, I'm sorry. The city attorney has um, provided an item that the council has added to your agenda that would clarify the mayor's authority to issue emergency proclamations. Um, so that whether or not it comes back, if the council approved this. Um, item, it would not have to come back to the full council for approval. Correct. 
And that item is added to, um, will be the first item considered under new business. Now, I do want to clarify that what this item, the uh, item prepared by the city attorney, it does not create a shelter in place or uh, um, resolution or proclamation. It simply provides that the mayor has that authority. Councilmember Smiley. I don't think that this resolution, um, this resolution is simply intended to direct the staff and the mayor to create and issue that proclamation as soon as they feasibly can. I don't think council has the ability to demand it, but it would be clear direction to the mayor that this was the sense of council. Is that the correct interpretation, Emmanuel? Uh, Emmanuel McGirt, City Attorney. Council could definitely direct the uh, mayor to consider issuing a uh, shelter in place um, proclamation if the, uh, the item that we have in front of council tonight is, is approved, uh, giving the mayor that additional authority to, to issue such a a, a wide-ranging proclamation. So council could dire direct that the mayor consider doing that. Thank you. All right, any other? So, so in order for the first motion to carry, we would need to yeah. move to approve. Right, what, okay. Uh, move. Um, uh, I'm sorry. So, is there clarification on everything? Does everybody understand where we're at? Where we're at right now? I do. So, are we just is the motion to discuss doing this, or to actually put it in place, and we're voting on putting that in place right now? I guess we'll put it in place. I would, I would ask. Um, Councilmember Bell. It would be to put this into place, and then it would we would we would need a separate we would need a separate motion, correct? Yeah. Just to clarify, if the count this item that is on the agenda. This item provide, would, then, would give the mayor the authority to provide for an emergency declaration which would limit movement in the community and would close certain businesses. It would give him the authority to do that. It would not, he you would not be doing it by approving this item. Right. You would be simply giving the mayor the authority to do that. Right. Correct, Emmanuel? So now what the council could do is you, you could wait and have discussion about this when the item comes up. Perhaps you, you'd you be comfortable yeah, withdrawing your motion. Let us get down to this item and have some more discussion. But that's certainly up to you, Councilman. Okay. I'm fine with withdrawing it for now. Yeah. All right. Motion's been withdrawn. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Floyd. Appreciate you being here again. All right. We'll move on okay. to the consent agenda. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. We have on the consent agenda the following items. The reclassification request in the Recreation and Parks Department. Item number two is an acceptance of the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Assistance Program funding from Pitt County. Item three is a contract with Cherry Beckard, LLP, for auditing services for fiscal year 2019-2020. Item number four is a contract award for professional services for mowing landscape maintenance contract for various locations as listed, which would be referred to as Public Works Department, contract number nine. Item number five is a contract award for professional services for, for landscape and turf maintenance for contract for 10th Street Cor Corridor and Highway 11, referred to as contract number 10. Item six is the approval to purchase five new stormwater vehicle and equipment for the engineering department and one replacement vehicle for the public works department and item seven are various tax refunds greater than a hundred dollars that is the consent agenda mayor All right. any questions or anyone would like to pull any of the items on the consent agenda move to approve second all right motion's been made by councilmember meyerhofer second by councilmember bell all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed aye. Okay. Opposed? No. Eyes have it. We will move. We'll move. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Okay. Okay. Eyes have it. So we'll move on to, I guess it would be the item. item. 
I, I think we're going to do the added item. Um, and so the added item is the one that um, um, a City Attorney McGirt can speak to. It is the clarification of the mayor's authority to issue emergency proclamations. City Attorney McGirt. Thank you, City Manager. Again, the item um, is, is in front of you, a memo and ordinance uh, clarifying the mayor's authority to issue a, an emergency proclamation. In terms of some background, City Council adopted uh, Title V, uh, Chapter 3, Article B of the City Code entitled States of Emergency in 2002. Uh, the Council, by adopting this ordinance, delegated to the mayor the authority to uh, proclaim a state of emergency and impose certain restrictions and prohibitions such as a curfew or denying access to certain areas of the city. Um, but that hasn't been uh, revised and brought up to date. Um, the North Carolina Emergency Management Act, uh, General Statute 166A-19.31, has been amended several times since 2002, the most significant revision being in 2012. And now the state law authorizes uh, when a proclamation is issued by the, by the council or the mayor, you can, you can limit movements of people in public places, uh, you can uh, close down business, business establishments, and it's this catch-all provision, other activities or conditions, the control of which may be reasonably necessary to maintain order and protect lives or property during the state of emergency. So uh, during this state of, uh, uh, of a national and state emergency, uh, COVID-19, the city staff requests that the mayor's authority to issue an emergency proclamation be clarified and expanded so the mayor has authority to, to, authority to impose all of the uh, restrictions or prohibitions authorized by state law. Um, so that gives the, the mayor access to all the remedies when issuing a proclamation under state law. The ordinance is transitory. It, it will not be placed in the city code, and it expires on December 31st, 2020. Um, so it will give the council a chance to, to consider this at a later date and um, it, it has an expiration date. So that, that is the request um, to council. Move to approve. Second. All right. Motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Litchfield. Any other discussion? I do have a question. Councilmember Daniels. So what about the individuals who work outside of Greenville? If you have somebody that works in, in uh, Wilson or areas such as that, how, what effect will that have on them, say, if we set a curfew? And I'm just curious. Well, they, they would be subject to the rules in Greenville. They're in, in city limits. They have to follow the rules. So if the curfew said 8 p.m., no person's on the street, they are, and they're in the city, I mean, I think the officer would probably ask them politely to, to leave so or comply. would not be included. Anybody who's within city limits within the, the emergency area would be included within the, within the proclamation. Okay. If I may, uh, we, we could also certainly include an exception in there. I mean, exceptions could be included in there. Yeah, if somebody's going to work, we can throw an exception there. But if, we can, if it came to that, I, I, okay. I think that's something we could reasonably add to any, um, anything that we were potentially to implement. But, but the motion on the floor is to approve this, which yes. would allow the mayor to make those types of decisions. Yeah. Right, right. But I just want the public watching to know that we're taking all these things into consideration. So. And, and we need to do that. Yeah. And yeah. so. in, in part of the discussion, I will say, too, this is just it is it's only solely for this instance, because I think yeah. that. Right. One of the discussions that we had was this is a very fluid situation where one day can make a huge difference and for all of us to get back together to be able to make an approval and maybe a little bit more difficult you know of course i think it's incumbent on me to make sure that i reach out to each one of you to make sure that i have your approval before we do ahead move forward with this so that was the reason behind asking for this request and to that point mr mayor this has a sunset provision correct. so it will expire yeah. correct just yes that's for everyone watching at home, and this is uh, not going to let the mayor be a dictator. This does expire. <laughs> All right, so motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Litchfield. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. All right, ayes have it.
We'll move on to item number, I guess, eight. Eight. Um, item number eight is a budget and ordinance amendment number nine to the 2019-2020 City of Greenville budget, the Capital Projects Fund, the FEMA Hurricane Projects Fund, and the newly established Engineering Capital Projects Fund. And um, Assistant City Manager Michael Cowan will provide that presentation. Thank you. Good evening. The budget ordinance uh, amendment number nine includes adjustments to the following funds, the general fund, the FIP fund, Public Works Capital Project Fund, Fire Rescue Capital Projects Fund, IT Project Capital Projects Fund, and the Engineering Capital Project Fund. The budget ordinance includes the following items. Entry to establish the Engineering Capital Project Fund for the Bill Grant. An item to recognize the insurance payments received as coverage from last year's ransomware attack. A transfer from the Police and Public Works Capital Projects Fund to the IT Capital Projects Fund to uh, cover various hardware and infrastructure upgrades. To recognize the transaction related to the swap of property on Bayswater Drive for Fire Station 7 project. To recognize the transfer made from the Capital Reserve during Budget Amendment Number 8 for the Convention Center Capital uh, Improvements. To recognize grant fundings received from the Transit Rope Program. Uh, to transfer funds from Recreation and Parks Capital Project Funds to the General Fund for the Little League Softball World Series. And to transfer funds from the FEMA Hurricane Project Fund to the Public Works Capital Project Fund. Overall, this budget amendment of the general fund stands at approximately $87.93 million for a total budget of $144.8 million. Okay. And we would recommend approval of budget ordinance number nine. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Litchfield. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Um, Councilmember Bell, I think, would like to... Yeah, I'd just like to call for point of order. I would like to renew my motion uh, that I had previously made, um, directing staff and the mayor to develop a shelter-in-place uh, declaration and to bring it back to city council if necessary. All right, motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by... Councilmember Smiley. Any discussion? So what's the shelter in place look like? I'll leave that up to how the mayor would like to and, and staff would like to have it drawn up, but I think there's a number of examples we could take from across the country or the world that have been put into place already. It gave him the authority to do so, yes. Mm -hmm. So what's the as, as Councilmember Smiley uh, initially mentioned, uh, the purpose would be to uh, direct the count, uh, direct the mayor, and let him know the feelings of the council. We just did that by passing that. We gave him the authority to do that. Correct. Right. All right. Any other discussion? I would like to. All right. You're up. I think that the import of this motion is to make it clear that council supports this principle and directs mayor and staff to, as soon as feasible, make, create and implement a, a shelter-in-place declaration and to offer our support for him to do that, that he need not stand on his own to do that, that we are willing to we go on record saying that it's important it needs to be done we're going to do it eventually we might as well do it now when it will actually help any other, any other discussions council member litchfield So I am in support of a shelter in place, um, the specifics of which I think are really important. Um, does that mean every family has to stay home? How about the individual that mows grass for a living? Um, 
I think specifics are important. And, um, you know, I think we need to be really careful about the economic impact of a, of a shelter in place and who it affects. Um, and so I am support of the mayor and city staff looking uh, at what that would look like and bringing it back to us. Um, and I would show my support to the mayor that it's important that we do something to protect the citizens, the health care system, uh, and the health care workers and minimize the impact of this virus. When and just for clarification, when you say bring it back to us, do you mean in a formal setting, or do you mean like via I, I'm not real sure. email? This is this is uh, Councilmember Bell's uh, motion. So what would you say? I guess the only and, and maybe Mr. Floyd can can add a little context to this because one of the things that we had talked about this weekend and the reason we felt like it was a necessity to do it in this manner was, you know, it's a very fluid situation where, you know, one or two days could potentially be a huge factor in when it needs to take place. And so one of the issues is, and, and I don't have any objection either way, I was just asking for a clarification as far as how do we bring it back? Do you want approval at a formal meeting or do you want approval at maybe through a electronic transmission where everybody gets an opportunity to go ahead and read through it and if they have any objections they can reach out to staff or myself I, I thought that was part of the original motion to my bring it back to council my motion was to bring it to council if necessary okay. Okay. if necessary without, without right. which it shouldn't be without your motion we don't need it to bring it back to council but with your motion we do yeah right because we, we have this in place because we have this in place already because we just gave him authority we can talk about it but with your motion now we have to come back my motion was if necessary which is not. All right, so Mr. Floyd, would you like to add some context to this? I would love to. Um, first, we are happy, uh, given that I realize this is a hard thing to just bring to this group cold and you, you have to make these rules up. And these things you're trying to do are built on epidemiologic factors that aren't clear to everyone, right? Um, I will say the county right now is taking a similar vote that was just passed for a shelter in place two weeks. It will be revisited in two weeks. And uh, what I understand that to mean, and I'm getting like text from the meeting, so there's, I don't have the actual documents in front of me, but what I understand that to mean, no gatherings of more than 10 people. Um, you can, you know, it doesn't say you can't leave the home. You can go to the grocery store. You can go to buy essential service goods and things of that nature. But um, it would otherwise be encouraged to stay at home unless you're doing those kind of activities. It doesn't mean people can't leave their house. Uh, they can't walk outside, those kind of things. It's minimizing the gathering of people, which is the thing we're trying to take care of. And we would be happy to help work with the mayor or council in whatever way you choose to help define those parameters in a way we think is helpful. So, Councilmember Daniels. So my thought process is, what about the supermarkets? I know they're not included. However, they do include a large gathering of people. Would it be wise to limit, like I went to the supermarket um, this weekend and they only allowed 50 people in at yeah. one time. I I, I am not a lawyer. I believe if you took a vote like this, and I would ask uh, Ann or your lawyers to help weigh in on that, but uh -huh. I believe if you took a vote like this to say shelter in place to 10 people, the supermarket could be open, allow for 10 people at a time in a common space kind of thing, okay. um, and those things could be drafted up, um, which has happened in other environments as well, is okay. what I believe, but I'm not a lawyer. We just gave motion. Just to make Emmanuel. it clear that the council believes that one is needed. That's why we just gave him the authority. Yeah, gave him the authority. It wasn't so a resounding with so, this ball rolling. So is, so is your motion more or less to show support and, and a request for me to move forward with a Absolutely. shelter in place? Yes. That's more or less what it is. And you made the motion. Council member Smiley second that motion. Yes. Is there any other discussion? So the motion is a show of support for a shelter in place. 
not to have staff put together a shelter in place and bring it back to council for us to vote on. Is that accurate? For the probably fifth time, yes. Okay. All right. Do you understand this? Madam yeah. Clerk? Can I just make sure that I have the motion down correctly? So the motion I have was to direct staff and mayor to develop shelter in place and bring back to city council if necessary. Is that correct? Yes. Do you want it to come back to city council? Only if necessary. <laughs> Councilmember Smiley, real quick. We need everybody to turn their mics on because some of the mics are not not on. Go ahead, Councilmember. My, understand, my understanding was that this was we were directing the staff and the mayor to de, to develop and implement a shelter in place proclamation as soon as it was feasible, and not to bring it back to council, but to just do it. Okay. So do you, do you basically want to? That's fine, if, if that's how it needs to Okay, be. so the motion needs to be that you're directing staff and the mayor to draft a shelter in place proclamation and you're just showing your support and asking for that to be enacted. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. it's, it's more or less a motion of support. Okay. Councilmember Smiley, are you okay with that? I am, thank you. All right. Any motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Smiley. Any other discussion before we vote? Okay. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion passes. So now we will move on to the city manager's report. Mayor, I have no report. All right. There's no report. Comments by the mayor and the city council. Councilmember Litchfield. Um, first and foremost, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Floyd for his attendance tonight uh, and the information shared. Um, obviously, uh, the situation we are in is uncharted territory, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. There's a tremendous amount of fear, um, not just in Greenville, but uh, across the United States and across the globe. And uh, it's important that everyone take precautions um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, interacting with as few as people as possible to um, you know, flatten the curve, as uh, Mr. Floyd had, uh, had suggested. Um, I also think it's important that um, we all, um, we all uh, consider um, the impacts that every individual and every family has, um, because there's some people uh, that have already lost their jobs. There are more people that will lose their jobs. There are individuals that will be um, infected by this virus. There are individuals that will lose their life or lose the loved one with this virus. Um, and we don't need to be tone deaf with what's going on uh, in our community, uh, in our neighborhoods, uh, in the state of North Carolina, in the United States or around the world. And uh, everybody needs to take this seriously. And, um, you know, once again, please, please pass on our, our sincere um, appreciation for um, you know, everyone at Biden and all the health care workers and, and um, all the things that they're doing to protect us. Councilmember Meyerhofer. Certainly echo everything uh, Councilmember Litchfield said. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Floyd coming tonight um, to you and your team again. Wish you all the best. I would just encourage everyone in the community to uh, if you know someone in the healthcare community, um, friend, neighbor, acquaintance, see what you can do to help them out because they're probably going to be stressed as we uh, navigate through this. Uh, and then the final item, I uh, received an email from Corbett Harris with the local Jimmy Johns and he just wanted me to get this information out to the public that uh, this week uh, from March 19th to March 30th at their three locations, on one on Fire Tower, one on Cotanch, and one on Moy, to help out with um, feeding the community and those kids that are no longer in school right now. 
the Jimmy John's at the three locations will be offering a Little John, which I guess is the little sub, um, at all three locations uh, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. And again, that is from March 19th through March 30th. So a uh, great gesture there by uh, Mr. Harris. Thank you for that. And uh, I am all set. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Bell. I would also like to thank the staff from Biden for coming out tonight and thank you for the presentation and thank you to everyone that's in the healthcare profession right now fighting on the front lines uh, against the coronavirus. Um, I would like to direct anyone who's seeking more information on the coronavirus, um, you know, support, uh, how, to, how to find out if you have symptoms and what to do if you're showing them to go to coronavirus.gov. Um, you know, we've also talked about the economic impact of this disease and, and, and the toll that it's taken on the communities uh, in not only our country and state, but around the world. Uh, there's links on here for small business support, uh, ways to get low interest uh, loans from the federal government, and really a whole litany of, of, uh, of support items. So again, that website is www.coronavirus.gov. And thank you very much. Council Member Daniels. Okay. Um, I won't. I would also like to thank Mr. Floyd and his team for all that you all are doing for our communities um, to make us safer. Um, I want to um, ask the public to take this seriously. I know it's hard. Staying in is, is really hard. Um, but this will pass, and we will get through this to the other side. But we want to take as many people as possible with us. We don't want any loss of life. Um, I thank the health care professionals. And March is Social Work Appreciation Month. So I thank all the social workers who remain on the front line as we continue to go out to the homes and ensure the safety of the children that we serve here in Pitt County in North Carolina. Thank you. All right. Please me. I think I'd be remiss if I did not uh, thank Mr. Floyd. Keep up with uh, everybody up here. Oh, hey, 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 I'm sorry. Councilmember Smiley. I want to thank my colleagues for making this vote tonight. I know that it's difficult to do, but I don't have to go very far to find a healthcare worker who will benefit from this. My wife will be intubating patients who have coronavirus. That's her specialty. And so it's very, I very much appreciate that you guys are willing to take this step to protect our community. All right. Mayor Pro Tem Glover. Uh, yes, I want to thank Mr. Uh, Ford for coming out and uh, explaining to people. Maybe they, they didn't see it. Um, one good thing that our council meeting is always um, um, televised, so everyone got to see your message. And I think your message tells us that we have to be urgent and we have to be vigilant of what is happening in our communities. Um, I also want to um, thank... Um, the um, council members who braved it out and came, went to the meeting. As you all know, I'm over 60, so I had, I'm one of the people who are, are staying in place. I know my place now. So um, I also uh, want to mention to the people who, to the, um, our listeners today, that our census will be coming out. Our census forms will be coming out on April the 1st, 2020. Please fill out your census form and return it back. It is very important to your city that you that you return your census form back because that tells us how much uh, federal monies we can get, and that also tells us about our housing program and all the monies that uh, federally. And we need to have everyone counted because. Uh, I know that we have grown tremendously in 10 years, so um, we want to have everybody to fill out their uh, census forms. And if you want to go online, you can visit 2020censusus.gov. I may have said it wrong. It's 2020census.gov. You can go online and fill it out as well online. Thank you, and um, to my fellow city council members, I just want to say to you to please be safe. And um, I know that some of you may have to work, but uh, please be safe and please be uh, cautious about 
what you're doing um, when you're out and about. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Floyd for being here today. I appreciate that. Um, echo the same uh, comments that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Glover said. Please make sure that you fill out your census data. It is very, very important that you do that. We are requesting that you do that. Uh, for a selfish reason, I tell you to do that because I still have a uh, challenge going on with the uh, mayor of Jacksonville, and I definitely want to win that one. Uh, but it's really important for our community because a lot of resources pour into our community based off of the census data. Uh, and finally, I just want to remind everybody when, while this is going on, it is important that you are not out in the community unless you absolutely have to be. There is no reason for you to be out just being with different people and spending times in large groups because you are damaging and hurting potentially people in our community by doing that. So. We have a new saying here at the city and the county uh, put this out as well is it's go home and stay home. Do not go out unless you absolutely have to. That doesn't mean that you need to be locked inside of your house nonstop and you cannot open your doors. That means don't go out and just hang out throughout the community, have parties, have play dates with other kids. Go home, be with your family. Um, if you want to go outside and you want to run, if you want to go out and play in the front yard with your children, go ahead and do it. Just make sure that you are socially distancing yourselves from other people because this is extremely important. We're at a point right now where we're making really, really drastic decisions and it's based off of people needing to listen to the people that are experts in this field. So go home and stay home and do not risk other people's lives because of it. And I am now looking for a motion to adjourn. All right, motion's been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Daniels. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it.